All right, everybody, it's Wednesday. We made it, Molly. We're, we're literally at the top of the mountain, and I've got my skis on, goggles, <laughs> and I am ready to hit the slopes. I'm only five weeks away from the opening of ski season. So let's Some go. Some people look forward to Christmas and Hanukkah. Yes. Pretty much, Jake House just counting the days. Counting the days. You got your little, like, calendar with the chocolates in it. When the snowpack lands in Tahoe, that's when I celebrate baby Jesus coming. That's truly when Jesus <laughs> arrives for me in the form of fresh pow pow. I need the pow pow. Oh my goodness. Well, we're kicking off the show with a little bit of talk about hmm. internet access in the mountains and how right. pretty soon we're going to have redundant internet. It might not be from 5G. It might be from space. Yeah. Starlink and Amazon's new uh, satellite system uh, is coming. And then we talk about TikTok, uh, some interesting jobs were listed. That's how a lot of journalists find out these uh, story angles. They look at the jobs and it looks like they're going to have fulfillment centers. So we talk about what TikTok might be up to in terms of e-commerce. God, we will buy so much stuff from TikTok. I'm almost terrified to contemplate it. Then we mm. have another Next Unicorns interview with Liquid Death CEO Mike Cesario, one of my new favorite interviews that I've ever done. It's going to be a great show. So stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Open Phone. As a startup founder, a lot of mistakes are easy to roll back, but using your personal cell phone number as your company number isn't one of them. Open Phone makes it easy to get business phone numbers for you and your team, right on top of your existing devices. Visit openphone.com slash twist to get 20% off your first six months. LinkedIn Jobs. A business is only as strong as its people, and every hire matters. Post your first job for free at linkedin.com slash unicorn and paperclip. In a downturn, every dollar counts. See where your firm's cash is going and stay on top of your runway with paperclip. Go to getpaperclip.com slash twist to get the app free for life. Such a fun interview today. Some good news. We're halfway through the week. Good. I'm spending the back half of the week. So when you see me in a different location tomorrow, oh, we're I'm going on a little Southern California leaf peeping nice. girls trip. Love it. I know, but don't worry. I optimized for an Airbnb with Starlink. So, oh, how nice. Uh, yeah. It can be a little jittery on the uplink, depending on what neighborhood you're in. I have a Starlink right there, there, there. and uh, that's going to go up in a week. And I got a router. I'm obsessed with these Unify. I think they're called routers mm -hmm. where you can put two internet connections in and it fails over. Oh, amazing. I love one. that. That's such a good life. Uh, yeah. Or you can have, I think you can have specific ports, you know, in your house, go to specific places. So I could say, hey, put all the TVs where we're just downloading, put those on Starlink, but then things that are uploading, like our desktops where we're doing Zoom, have those be on the, you know, cable. Mm, yeah. So, but it, it doesn't do it dynamically, um, or I think you can do dynamic. Where you can load balance. So if like, a, you know, a bunch of people there, so I got to play with it. But I think that this is going to be the future. I realized, you know, uh, Amazon is coming out. I mean, think it's going to become yeah. the standard. Amazon yeah. is uh, having their, I don't know if you saw their Starlink competitors going up and there's a third one. So there'll be three of these. Yeah. I bet you somebody creates a satellite dish that allows you to connect to all three and then bundles it and you give, you know, this is like corporations or whatever, or corporations mm -hmm. will just put three of them on the roof of their buildings or hotels. They'll put three of them on the roof of the buildings and then they'll have a fiber line or a cable line and you'll have four different interconnections coming into a hotel, into the router. And then, you know, hey, if one connection starts getting, you know, jittery and you start to see the pings going up, you deprecate that when you use the other ones. Yeah. And then the idea that you would lose internet is going to go away. I could see it being bundled. I could see you buy Starlink and Infinity and you get both to your house. Now yeah. you never have to worry about it. just like people are going to be off the grid and have solar battery packs and generators. This I mean, resiliency really, in your home is it's coming. It's so, uh, that's so true and so overdue. And it is so interesting that 5G was supposed to be that, right? It was yes. going to be this like home broadband redundancy and it's taken so long that it's being leapfrogged by stuff being shot into space. Yes. That's pretty embarrassing on the part of the 5G rollout. <laughs> I saw somebody, <laughs> like their, note. I think Verizon <laughs> 5G is the the gold standard on this and it's so cheap. So I think what they're going for is like, hey, we'll, we'll give you like 5G at home for 25 bucks a month, 30 bucks right. a month. Exactly. And, and that would be great yeah. redundancy, but it's just not, it's not widespread enough yet. Yeah. I mean, the fact that we are, are you know, 
filling up low Earth orbit faster than we're rolling out 5G, I think is an under slightly underreported story for other folks to do. If you just search, uh, I, I've been seeing this in my in my Twitter feeds. Um, yeah. uh, I don't know if you're on this website, uh, the twitter.com. Oh. Uh, people mm -hmm. can post uh, what's going on in their lives. And, uh, you know, I, I've been seeing people with Verizon, because they're so like, whoa, check this out. I got 400 megabits down with this thing mm -hmm. that's, you know, on my windowsill. Uh, and this. it's pretty dope um, for people who are city dwellers to have this. Right. I want that. But I just live on a in the urban part of a major freaking US metropolis. So I don't have this. Yeah, it's kind of, all anyway, this is what's great about, about this is, is this is going to create downward pressure on prices. Mm -hmm. So all this idea that you're paying 100 bucks for your internet is going to go, yep. you know, to 50 to 25. And in places like Korea and Japan, $15 fiber, $30 fiber is kind of the standard because it's gotten to be so dogged. Yep. And I'm really rooting for Verizon and for Starlink to really give it to, you know, Xfinity and Xfinity and all what's these, the one in New York know, that's always down always. Uh, and then there's like Spectrum cable, in LA that's always spec. down. <laughs> like, yeah, they your just days are numbered out long last. I also feel like they don't um, give great service, you know, and no, now all the no. service is getting better. I noticed with my Xfinity now, when they do go down and you go to the website, Molly, they're on top of it, you mm -hmm. know, and the and the downtime is like, okay, this is going to be 30 minutes. And it's we know that you're, it's just accurate, like they seem to have invested right. in customer support, as opposed to being like, you have no choice. Why would we pick up the phone oh, and tell well. you what's going on? Because they do know I do think they sense that this competition is coming because every every couple of months too, I'll get an email that's like your speeds are faster now. No reason. Oh, you, I love that one. Change, but your, that's your one speeds of my are faster. Favorites. And I'm like, Oh, super. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, let's do a little news. Can, can uh -huh. you tell me what's going on in the news there, Molly? Because we do have today, as we mentioned in the intro, uh, another Next Unicorns. Yes. And you want to stay tuned for this. Yes. Because it is the interview with the Liquid Death CEO. And I think like... Fantastic. It's just a great interview. He's such an interesting person. And it also fundamentally is just so... We talk all the time about backing builders, right? That's mm -hmm. our slogan. We back builders. Yes. This guy, Mike Cesario, he's a brand builder. It's just a completely different type of builder that I think uh, this our founder audience is really going to appreciate. He's just a brand genius. I just love great, that as a great conversation. You, know, you, you have to be really great as a, f a brand builder to mm -hmm. have that actually be a superpower. Like any developer, any UX developer, a good salesperson, like a good developer, a good designer, uh, a good sales executive, like, okay. Right. Good product manager, you're, you're like going to make a, a good contribution. But for brand, you have to be elite for it actually to move the needle. And Liquid Death is clearly elite. Yeah, clearly. that's kind of what I as like the startup takeaway. That's kind of what mm. I love about this conversation is that like, it's a different kind of building. But not everybody can be a founder. Not everybody can be a developer. Mm. Hardly anybody can be a brand genius at this level. Hey, Nick, this Great. is something I wanted to do for ski season. Um, I, I got some criticism. Uh, somebody's like, Oh, I love J Cal. I love this week startups, but they talk about the news too much. Not enough. Um, I, I like the old days of this week in startups when J Cal would interview a founder for ski season. I want to lock in Nick to doing a series a solo dole or interview, maybe do it like Monday afternoons or something. Then we can book that for Thursdays or something. And then Molly and I get the day off. We don't have to do news that day. We recapture a day. And that means I can ski in the morning. Molly's giving me hearts. Thank you. Molly. I'm giving him hearts. I'm giving him okay, hearts. What's in the news? Quickly. We got to just we gotta, means we gotta, I get to I invest get to more. Okay. TikTok appears to be planning to build product fulfillment centers. What? In the US, according to Axios, and may be trying to compete with Amazon. Hmm. Axios reported this story, citing more than a dozen job openings related to this potential project on LinkedIn over the past two weeks. This would mark TikTok's first move into e-commerce hmm. and could potentially be a whole new revenue stream and obviously a whole new business hmm. for TikTok, who uh, apparently is on the march to complete domination of the US economy. Yeah, okay. So I think what they've realized, you know, this is a Chinese company. Uh, what? And yeah, TikTok's um, <laughs> the origination is China. 
Woo! And that's where they make fast fashion and fast gadgets, Amazon mm -hmm. basics, all this stuff, you know, originates mm -hmm. in the factories in China, Molly. So these founders and the, they understand this dynamic, what they probably have also put together is that a lot of products are trending on TikTok and then resulting in sales, whereas mm -hmm. Amazon hasn't been able to figure out social media. And Instagram was not able to figure out commerce. Right? Remember Amazon was uh, Instagram oh, yeah. was going to own this business and they just gave up. And then up. they just recently, very recently, right? Just totally backed away from yes. Instagram shopping. They were like we're not doing that anymore and TikTok was like, yeah. "Thanks guys, we'll just Well, scooch and on here's in the here. thing. You could have made it work if you went full stack. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably the issue here is going full stack is hard. And then there was also the they might have given up because of the Apple you know, stopping the retargeting and making it harder to do ads or whatever. I, I'm not sure exactly what the reason Facebook gave up and Instagram gave up on commerce. But this seems like a pretty good idea. This is a great idea. I mean, it really is like local fulfillment. So if you're not afraid of infrastructure, mm -hmm. then this is brilliant. If you're meta, and you're just focused on the metaverse, and you don't think <laughs> that yeah. the real world matters, and that people still want to buy real stuff. And to be clear, half of the reason that we still have supply chain issues is because of too much demand, people are still shopping for so much stuff that we have backups as a result. And TikTok is like, yeah, I think we've figured out the American psyche, which is that they don't want to just be in the metaverse, they actually want to buy real stuff, and they want to get it quickly. And right now, there's really kind of only the one place to do that. Hmm. I mean, people don't you turns out everyone just side note, you can get free one or two day shipping from Target. Just yes. just throwing that out there. Like, I know no one knows, but you can. But everybody defaults to Amazon. And so it's very interesting and clever that TikTok would basically do one of the noties just said it's effectively fulfilled by Amazon. But it would be hmm. like fulfilled by TikTok, just localized drop shipping. You know, all of these big companies start to dabble because it seems easy. Remember Google Go? Google had a shopping app that was I mean, going don't to get me be started on Google and all it's like, now we're going to try this yeah. and this and this. Well, and then they give up, right? And there was yeah. that whole thread on Reddit, where starting is easy, some PM, some product manager, some talented people do stuff at Google, it gets some traction, but not enough. And it just looks small compared to Google Chrome or Gmail or YouTube, you know, you just have this problem of things looking tiny in comparison to the largest decade long or multi decade products in the world. And then people yeah. give up. And it's just a hard thing to focus for a decade on something. So people focus for three to five years. And then they pull the plug because it hasn't broken out. I have a prediction and or recommendation TikTok basics, TikTok basics, just start with cameras and phone related stuff, TikTok cases, TikTok charging battery packs just buy anchor knock off mm -hmm. anchor whatever it is don't knock off anchor because i love that product brand. but you get the idea just yeah. do TikTok basics now yeah. when you're swiping through you know everything about me you know i'm into cooking videos that's my jam chef's reactions my favorite channel okay you show me a TikTok basics you know a uh, non-stick pan uh you know something to cook eggs a knife yeah you know but i wind up buying some of those cooking gadgets i see them on TikTok, and then i go mm -hmm. to amazon Mm -hmm. If I was in TikTok, mm, I might actually cl one click to buy if it was like an interesting, unique product. So I would the same way TikTok curates interesting content on an algorithmic basis, they should only do really cool viral products, mm -hmm. things that you either like that's a staple or you know, that they can put their TikTok thing on that's related to the TikTok brand or something really cool, right? And yeah. man, that would be amazing. And they have a million verticals to work within, right? Like mm. if you're just so you're on cook talk, I'm mm. on pet talk, and everybody on pet talk has their dogs uh, mm -hmm. trained to use those little buttons that that make words. And oh, the dogs yeah. will be like, Mom, oh, I saw play somebody doing now. that. And it was, Mom, play. it was like, cookie, B yeah. word, cookie, B word. Right. <laughs> it's like, totally. Oh. <laughs> it's eerie, though, right? And then the dogs are just like, now, now. Now, but you could sell me that I would watch if I had just watched 13 Molly, of those, like, they're, boom. They're, that's not real. They're putting the words in after. Well, no, they're not. Yes, they are. No. <laughs> yes, they are. They Don't have the dogs come up and just hit them randomly. Then they put the words in. Molly. They do not. Molly, <sighs> also, you know, the people throwing the ping pong balls and it hits like off frying pans and then like lands on the top of the classic Coke bottle and goes perfectly into it. They have a person on a green screen with a stick with the ping pong ball 
and they're literally going bink, 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 and then resting it on the top. You monster. It's done with the green screen. <laughs> you're I being believe that about the ping pong balls, but you're telling me you're those none played. of the dog. Come on, some of those dogs are talking. No. And then you know the thing with the Mentos and they put it in the Coke bottle? The Coke bottle underneath has a hose in it. <laughs> And they put the Mentos in and then they just turn the hose on and it goes shooting. That's why it doesn't work when you do it. It's all a sleight of hand. You're being duped. It's Living. all post. It's all I being like my post. world. I like my sweet summer child existence where the dogs know how to talk. The dogs are liars. You want the dogs to talk, Molly. You want the you wanted the dogs to talk. That's right. And TikTok knows it. And that's why. Yes. Prior to today, I would have bought the crap out of the little dog talker. Anything else in the news that we need to know about? I mean, need is a strong word. Uh, should? Like, the, for the sake of the audience, we should. For the sake of the audience. For the sake of the audience. Uh, uh, I think we could save a conversation about Meta's new VR product. That happened. We all know that was going to happen. Yeah. We all know it's going to continue to get incrementally better. It doesn't seem like we have to belabor it, especially since we have such a great interview for you today in the next unicorn series yes liquid death enjoy everybody on the program today is darina kulia she is the founder of open phone welcome to the show darina thank you so much jason great to be here now what mistakes do most founders make with phone numbers in their startups really delegation right because what ends up happening is that as a founder when you're starting you do everything. You are the salesperson, the support person, the... You make the coffee, you do HR, marketing, sales, recruiting, everything. Yeah. But then eventually you you have you have people joining the team and what ends yep. up happening is if, if as a founder, your phone number, let's forget about the privacy, the spam, all that problem, let's say it doesn't exist, but you're not gonna want a year into your company, two years into your company to have all the support calls or oh. all the questions come to you because now you've just hired your support team. Why did you hire them? Yep. So that's another reason why having that separate number makes so much sense because you can always delegate those calls to your team as you grow. All right, everybody, here's your CTA, the old call to action. Twist listeners, 20% off any plan for your first six months. Just sign up at openphone.com slash twist. And if you got an existing number, no problem. They'll put it right over. Open phone dot com slash twist o p e n p h o n e dot com slash twist today for twenty percent off. Mike Cesario is the CEO and co-founder of the beverage brand Liquid Death, which we talked about recently on the show, raising seventy million dollars at a seven hundred million dollar valuation. Congratulations on that, first of all, and welcome to this week in startups. Thank you. Tell me everything. How? <laughs> So I'm looking for those who are not watching the video. You've got a black brick wall behind you and a Slayer t-shirt on Look, like very on brand for liquid death. But I wonder like just as a starting point, how much does this brand represent your own personality? Uh, it, it's pretty close to an exact replica, <laughs> 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 which, um, which, you know, it, and it's even when I worked in marketing prior to liquid death for, you know, I was a creative director for agencies and, the best advice I would give to companies is your brand cannot actually be that different than the top decision maker mm -hmm. because they are ultimately going to kill things. Like it, you can't fake things anymore. You can't say, Oh, we're going to be a edge. You know, we're going to be a youth brand, but the guy who has to sign off on all the ideas is not a youth person. Doesn't have that kind of personality. You're not, you're just going to put out bad versions of that stuff. So it's, it's always like we would try to get companies to figure out who are the actual people that run your company? What are you into? Like, what makes you you? And how do you make your company reflect that? Because then when your brand is a, ref a reflection of you, making decisions is so much easier. It's like, no, we're never doing that. Yes, that's good. Yes, this is funny. That's not funny. Versus when you're trying to be something you're not, you're like, wait, will this be funny to these people? I don't know. I'm not those people. So right. It, it definitely makes it makes it easier for us to to move as fast as we move. moving. So at what point did you say, I would imagine you met, ran into a lot of like not very interesting executives and couldn't build brands around them. And I wonder like at what point you were just like, you know what, I'm going to do my own thing. And that thing, by the way, is going to be making well, water awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a, a two-pronged question uh, here. <laughs> 
Yeah. No, no. I mean, you know, I, I grew up playing in bands, you know, I, that's how I got into the, you know, creative stuff. Like as a little kid, I was always into drawing. Like I was the kid that could draw in school. And then once we started playing in bands, I was the guy that was like designing the t-shirts and the show flyers and I was silk screening stuff. And it was almost like in, in, in the punk world, DIY has been this thing forever. And it was in, mm -hmm. I think that was where I got a lot of that entrepreneurial, just like you, you kind of run your own little business as a band, like you're, and you're doing everything. Um, and I always really liked that. And, uh, you know, I didn't even know that graphic design was a real job when I was 15. Like it was a thing I did. I had a friend whose dad was like an award-winning graphic designer in Philadelphia. And I saw all the stuff he did. I'm like, oh, weird. That's like an actual job. People pay you to do that. Because I was always like, oh, what do you want to do, Mike, when you grow up? I'm like, I don't know, like something with business, I think, because, you know, I didn't, but general. Um, but then I ended up going to school for graphic design and then switched into advertising in college because I was always into just making people laugh. Like when I would draw stuff, it was like silly cartoons and like I had Mad Magazine as a super early kid and like, you know, our family is into really funny movies. Like, so it's like, I was always into to being funny. And it was like advertising seemed like the place where creativity and design could be funny, whereas design was very regimented. It was like mm -hmm. pixel perfect. And it's more like architecture almost. So I, I switched to um, advertising. And, you know, I, I went to work for an agency called Crispin Porter and Bogusky in Colorado. And they were one of the more disruptive agencies that were, we're doing weird, funny, what the kind of things. And as like a, you know, my background personality, that appealed to me way more. I didn't even want to work anywhere else. I'm like, I want to work at that place. I don't want to make, I don't know, like T-Mobile commercials. Like I want to make cool things, right? So went there and um, Made some really cool stuff, like really learned advertising and, and that disruptive approach. And, you know, we even use a lot of the things that we do in Liquid Death now. Like when we worked at that agency, they were always about, will this idea get press? Like, how do you make things that create earned media where they're so interesting mm -hmm. that people have to talk about it and spread it for free because it's that interesting? Yeah. Um, and then once I'd left there, um, and worked for these other agencies for years after that, it really was clear that, oh, that place is a special place and there's no other place like this. Even though these other places were offering me lots more money and like, oh, we want the, we want the Crispin guy to come over here. And, you know, even though we're not creative, we want to be way more creative. And the reality is they can't change. It's because right. again, the top decision maker, it can't ever be, it can only be as good as the top. You can hire all the cool people down below. If the guy at the top doesn't get it, doesn't understand it, it's never going to make it out into the world. So I think after a few years of just doing really uncreative advertising or not at the level that I wanted to do, I just felt really creatively stagnant. And it literally came out of the idea of, and at that time, I was trying to get jobs back at these really creative places. I'm like, oh, took the money to come to the uncreative place. Now I want to get back into the creative places and they wouldn't hire me because it's all based on your portfolio and they don't want to see fake work in your book. They want to see real work. So mm -hmm. when you have these clients that want to do just really crappy marketing and don't want to buy good ideas, I had nothing in my portfolio to show. So I couldn't get jobs at these places. Then all of a sudden I felt trapped. I'm like, crap, I backed myself into a corner where I'm not making creative stuff and I can't even get into the places making creative stuff. So hmm. I was like, you know what? I think I just have to create my own brand to create marketing for. And that was when I, the very first thing that I, I built was actually a spirits company where I wanted to make brandy cool and kind of a similar thing, like find a <laughs> stale category yeah. and be the one cool brand in it. And, and I kind of got that. At that time, I was working on Virgin America, the airline at the agency. Yeah. And I started reading Richard Branson books. And I loved Virgin's approach of like, find a stale category like air travel where there's not one sexy, cool thing about it. 
make this cool, fun brand that almost changes the industry. And they would do that in all these different industries. I still have that so song I in my head like, right now. I can hear that song uh, <laughs> right now. <laughs> I'm trying so hard yeah. not to burst into song. Anyway, yes, please, please continue. <laughs> so when was this? This was uh, the Brandy attempt. This was like 2000. This was like 2012. Okay. Um, I was working for an agency in, in San Francisco called Eleven. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, just was pretty bored there. Um, not doing anything that interesting. Um, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to, okay, what's like a, cause I was really into spirits. Like I, lo I loved all the different whiskeys, tequilas, mezcals. Like I was dating someone who was like a mixologist at the time. My other best friend, she worked for a wine distributor. I'm like, oh, I'm more in the world of spirits than the average person. So I feel like I could have an advantage going into that category. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, okay, well, what category should we go into within spirits? And it's like, okay, well, what is the, where is there no cool brands at all? And it was right. hard to find because there's like a million vodkas, a million whiskeys, a million tequilas. And then found brandy where it was literally, there was dust on the bottles in the liquor store where I, where I bought the first bottle yep. of it. And then I tried it and I was like, oh, this is actually really similar to bourbon. It's just a little bit sweeter. Um, why, and, and whiskey was the most popular spirit. Why is this spirit not as popular? Clearly, it's a brand problem. Mm -hmm. And um, found a way to create like a fun, more whiskey-esque brandy brand. And then found a distillery in Northern California that had been making some of the best brandy for like 20 years. Pitched it to them. They were like, oh, this is great. We've been waiting for someone to give a shit about brandy. Um, and then they're like, we'll make it. You know, We'll do a partnership. Then I found a couple of alcohol industry folks that created Hendrix Gin and Sailor Cherry Rum. They thought it was really interesting. They joined up. I moved back to my hometown of Philadelphia where these other people were based. And we kind of built, we got a spirit company off the ground, which was a nightmare because it's all legal red tape. It's like yeah. every state is different. And Pennsylvania is one of the worst states. It's still, it's government owned liquor stores. Right. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. So it was just, we never got to the fun part. It was never marketing. It was not brand. It was just like getting through legal stuff and permits. And then you don't even have the money to do marketing. So it's just about like finding bartenders that want to push it and doing tastings. And it just was, I ended up butting heads with the people I joined forces with. And we didn't see eye to eye on the brand. And I, I was just like, you know what? You guys take it from here. I'll take my little piece of vested equity or whatever, and I'm going to go back to the agency world and I'll, you know, I'll figure out my next thing. Best of luck to you guys. So, so then is I that went it? To, is cool. Brandy dead. It literally just died last July, but it's been around mm -hmm. for like eight years. You know, what is that? Like almost 10 yeah. years. They, they were just run. Yeah. They just, they couldn't figure out the brand. And that was why we butted heads. They kept trying to figure out what is it? What is it? And then finally, before the pandemic, they started getting some traction as they were really focusing on like um, high end cocktail bars. And they got some famous cocktail folks involved with the brand really starting to do well in like Texas and Northern California and some other places. But then once the pandemic hit and all the bars closed, yeah. I think that was just like the, la the final blow. And then they just sort of had to, had to close to up shop. Tequila did kind of eat the world. Yeah. 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 But we're off topic. We will end up back yeah. in water. All right, everybody, LinkedIn jobs. We have to talk about the downturn right now. There is one silver lining for all of us running businesses, especially small businesses or nascent companies. You know, when you got that half dozen, dozen people, the talent pool is getting stronger and stronger. And people are looking for interesting companies to go work for. And that's where you come in. And that's where LinkedIn's going to solve all your problems. When you run a startup, you run a small business, you know, every single new hire is high stakes. So you have to ask yourself, what if I hire the wrong person? What is that going to do to my team, my team dynamics? Well, that's why you have to check out LinkedIn jobs. There's so much great talent out there right now. And LinkedIn jobs helps you find the right people for your team. And they help you do it faster. Now you want to be 100% certain you have the right candidate pool that you're looking at. Well, that's LinkedIn. You're talking about over 800 million people are there. Use screening questions. Ask people thoughtful questions. Hey, what do, if you were a podcasting company, what do you love about podcasting? What are your top three podcasters and why? Hey, if you're an app company, have you downloaded our app and what do you think of it? And maybe give me some feedback. 
So that will help you filter the people who really want to come work for you who have that passion. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster post your job for free at linkedin.com slash unicorn that's linkedin.com slash unicorn to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Okay, so, so, so the, yeah, how so, much did that inform then the thought like, you know, what would be way easier here is water. 100%. Yeah. So yeah. when I left, once I was only in back in Philadelphia to do the, the brandy. And then once I was like, okay, now I'm not going to be a part of this anymore. Uh, a buddy of mine had an age, a small startup marketing agency in Chattanooga, Tennessee called Humana. And he was like, hey, do you want to come down and kind of help me run the agency um, as a creative director? And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I never thought about Tennessee, but it was interesting. And they were doing some cool stuff. So I moved down to Tennessee. And then we started doing some of the first funny, irreverent marketing for like the organic industry. So we had um, this brand called Organic Valley. They're like a massive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whole Foods, like massive, I think like multi-billion dollar brand. They were launching the first organic protein shake. Now, all of their other marketing was very like sunsets over family farms. And it's like our farmers, they care more than anybody else. But they knew that with a protein shake, they're talking to a very different audience. It's like gym rats, like mm -hmm. dudes trying to get big, like... um so they knew they had to take a different approach. So that so they they worked with some other agency for most of the other stuff. They kind of came to us as like this one off sort of thing because we had built a little bit of a reputation of making internet videos for brands that would get tons of views. So we created this campaign called Save the Bros, um, where it's like if bros keep drinking these chemically protein shakes, they're going to go extinct. And then who's going to bring the beer pong table? And we made this really funny, <laughs> nice. heartfelt. PSA and uh, it ended up going totally viral on the internet. All these news outlets picked it up. And it, and it was mostly because nobody had ever seen organic marketed in this like really cheeky, irreverent way. And that was like a big aha moment for me as, oh, right. How come healthy things that I care about and a lot of people I know, even in the world of punk rock and metal and alternative culture, lots of people care about this stuff. It's not mm -hmm. some niche tree hugger thing that maybe it was 20 years ago. Um, and then that's when I, you know, I knew that I was going to create some other company. Like once I had the taste of, of the brandy, I was like, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. Nothing was more rewarding than building something on my own and, and versus just like being a service for other companies, you know? Right. right. Um, so I knew it was going to create some other thing. And then, yes, I was like, okay, what is the easiest thing to create where I'm not worried about ingredient sourcing or crazy permits or anything like that, but it needs to be healthy. And it needs to be something that I legitimately am a consumer of. Like, and I would drink a lot of water and a lot of my friends mm -hmm. drank water. Um, so water just kind of naturally became the thing. And then I just so slow, slowly started building this concept of canned water to make it feel more like a bad thing you're not supposed to have, like a beer yeah. or a soda or an energy drink. Like most people never associate you're holding a freezing cold can of something totally healthy. Like right. doesn't doesn't really happen, right? So then, yeah, over the next few years, I just kind of was working random agency jobs and things like that. Uh, moved back to Southern California. Um, and was working for agencies. I was just kind of building Liquid Death as a side project and just kind of refining the name and the branding and the approach. <clears throat> and then finally, once kind of landed on the, you know, what it would be, I knew that nobody was going to write me a check for the idea of Liquid Death because it mm -hmm. sounded absolutely crazy and like it was never going to work. Like, oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> Liquid Death, you know. <laughs> It looks like beer. You're just going to confuse people. They're not going to buy it. You know, folks said retailers will never put that on the shelf. Like they're too conservative. So I, using my design background, we created uh, a 3D render of a can that looked real. Mm -hmm. And we created a Facebook page, no Instagram, no Twitter, just a Facebook page. I came up with a funny idea for like a video commercial for it that we went and shot for 1500 bucks 
And then we put the video on Facebook. We, we made a couple of funny social posts with the product that looked real. And, uh, you know, we put maybe a few grand in paid media behind some of the posts over the course of maybe four months. And the video had 3 million views. The page had 80,000 followers, which was more than Aquafina on Facebook at the time. And we had like hundreds of messages and comments from people being like, this is the coolest thing ever. Where do you get this? Or is this real? We had a guy that owned three 7-Elevens being like, hey, I own three 7-Elevens in Michigan. How do I get this in my stores? Wow. We had a huge distributor in New York be like, we're one of the biggest non-alc distributors. Can we talk to a salesperson? So then I use all that traction to then go raise an actual small round of funding to produce real product. And then once we had real product, then this like funny internet thing that almost seemed like a fake joke, where a lot of people thought it was, was fake. Now, when it was real, it was a whole different thing. Mm-hmm. And then that's when we kind of got connected with our first institutional investor, uh, Science Inc., yeah. that was behind yeah, Dollar Shave Club and all that. Um, and then we launched it on the internet. Uh, late January, early February, 2019. And we had to launch on the internet because there was no retailer that would touch this to start with. So it Not was even Amazon. 7-Eleven? Well, yeah, he was into it, but it's like, <laughs> you know, you know, you're going to make, you know, a few hundred bucks selling right. three 7-Eleven right. stores. Uh, so we launched on Amazon and our website. And then it was like the first month we were selling, we spent Two thousand dollars on marketing, and we did a hundred thousand dollars in sales. That's and insane. then it just and then it just kept going, and then the media caught wind of it, kind of mm-hmm. went viral. Then it shot up even more, and then you know towards the end of the first year, we had a ton of buzz. We were selling a ton of product online, and then Whole Foods was kind of the first retail hand raiser actually that reached out and we're like, hey, this is super interesting to us because we really do care about sustainability and you guys have the death to plastic um, message, but you're doing it in a way that doesn't sound like anybody else. So they took us full national out of the gate, but we literally, our load-in date for Whole Foods was March 15th, 2020, the, the, the week the, the lockdown started. Right. So our first year in retail was really, you know, one where people weren't even allowed in stores or it was, it was limited. Um, so really like last year was really like our first like real year in retail where people were in stores. We had a few more retailers. And then now ever since, you know, the retail explosion happened and now it's just flying off shelves everywhere we, we launch it and outperforming everyone's sort of expectations. Cause you know, a lot of these buyers, like they're not the most, culturally marketing savvy people like they're like liquid death like, i don't know are people going to protest in the parking lot like <laughs> are they going to you know like they're, they're always just very risk averse and then almost without fail everyone we've launched with they're like it's one of the most successful new beverage launches they've ever done now they're all believers and love it and, and, and it's you know and it just took time wow Founders, when you know your numbers at your startup like the back of your hand, you're going to come across two investors as super credible. Your credibility equals closing. Your ability to close deals, your ability to close investors is going to be based on your credibility. Well, I want to tell you about Paperclip. This is going to make you more credible today. It's a free instant financial dashboard that pulls all of your most important numbers and puts them at your fingertip. You just plug in your bank, your credit card, and your financial accounts, and Paperclip gives you instant access to the most important metrics like your net cash, your burn rate, and your runway. So stop wasting time crunching these numbers in spreadsheets. No, nope, don't wait for your accounting. That's lame. You want to use Paperclip. And I want you to see why thousands of startups trust Paperclip to help manage their finances. Check out Paperclip and get real-time visibility into your financials today. It takes less than five minutes to set up and Twist listeners get the app for free for life by going to getpaperclip.com slash twist. That's right. It's typically 30 bucks a month. But if you use my link, you get it free for life. There's no downside. Go to getpaperclip.com slash twist today. It's such a remarkable story on multiple levels, right? One is the content story. We have talked a lot about how you kind of cannot be a modern brand without an actual content strategy. And you basically built an, you know, an MVP, like a minimum viable product out of content, yeah. which is already fantastic. Then there's this kind of like, I don't know, brand category that I'm calling unironically ironic. Hmm. Like, 
describe the process of building this brand and being like, yeah, we're calling it liquid death. It's going to be in a can and there are going to be people who buy it because they think it's a hilarious thing to have at parties. But then you were marketing to a specific audience, right? Like straight edge and these shows where you sometimes can't have a plastic bottle or you can't have a lid. I mean, it seems like the band experience even feeds into, we'll get to sustainability in a minute, but like the benefits of having a can as like you said, the branding that looks like beer, it's a, it's a, it's a container that can exist in more places maybe. Yeah. I mean, the way we market, we, we actually don't market to a specific audience. You know, it's not, we don't market to straight edge people or punk rock people. It's like, yeah. we just think about it. Like we think about our marketing team more like Saturday Night Live. We are in the business of creating entertainment and specifically comedy entertainment. We want to make people laugh. The whole brand is built on that. Like, mm-hmm. And when you approach it that way, it's like, when you think about real entertainment and even like real entertainment on the internet, you know, it's like Saturday Night Live has hilarious skits with Will Ferrell where blood's streaming down his head because he's doing something funny. It's like, is, are they targeting punk rock and metal people with that? You know, it's like, right. no, it, it's so you just weren't. That's a, that's a like misconception. Oh, oh, right. Yeah. So, yeah. Right? No, it's, it, I mean, I come from that world. So if I think something's funny, there's probably going to be a lot of other people like me that think it's funny. Right. But, it but I think really- there is, th- it's funny because there's this perception that you went out to very sincerely target this audience. And it's kind of awesome that that is not the case either. Like, there's so yeah. many ways to understand or misunderstand your brand. And it doesn't really matter because either way you're buying it. Totally. Yeah. I mean, we just want to make people laugh. That's all. Yeah. And it's like, especially in beverage and CPG, people think way too rationally. But then you look at other categories and people don't, like horror movies, for example. Mm-hmm. Like, Jordan Peele does Get Out, one of the biggest movies that there was that year, horror movie. Who goes to the, who, how, how many different kinds of people go to be entertained by that horror movie? It's not just metalheads and punk rock people. It's right. moms, women, young, old. Like, it's anybody that, like, and, and I think that's the thing that CPGs always got wrong. Like, people think, okay, if you have a product that has a female consumer, you have to put a flower on it. You've got to use pink, but you look at data and a couple of years ago, the number two most popular scripted show for women was The Walking Dead, a show about flesh eating zombies. Yeah. Number one was This Is Us, which is, you know, it, its own kind of thing. But oh, like, you. <laughs> you have data showing that tons of women are entertained by this, but how many female centric brands are doing a zombie campaign, right. you know? But I think that's, but I think you just have to look outside of, of kind of the, I don't know, very myopic CPG industry and look at other industries and borrow from there, like entertainment, you know, for one, especially when we're creating entertainment. So yeah, yeah it's, it, it's just about, we, we just want to make people laugh and it's not an easy thing. It's like comedy is hard. Like you look at very super veteran comedians, like Jerry Seinfeld, when he does a 60 minute special. He spends a year or two going around to little tiny clubs testing jokes out because even he doesn't know what's going to be funny or not. It's like he thinks something, oh, this is going to kill and it doesn't work. But then some little aside that he does has the crowd roaring. He's like, oh, that's funny. I'm going to turn that into something. So we kind of feel the same way. It's like we have to really hit a narrow target sometimes where if it's two degrees this way, it's lame and not funny. Two degrees this way, it's actually offensive and untasteful <laughs> and, and people don't want to laugh at it. It's like, it's really hard to hit that bullseye, but I think we've got the right sensibility and taste to be able to do it constantly because that's just what we do. What, um, what hasn't worked? Like, what have you tried that you found that, you know, that you just had to spike because it turned out kind of cringe? We haven't luckily done anything cringe. I I think where we found things is like, you know, we built this brand as an internet first brand, you know, Mm -hmm. like social media, like that's where everyone spends their time. Like that's where you can command attention. It's literally created movie stars, pop stars. Like it's the place if you can really be powerful there, you can win. Um, And I think we started with a very, you know, we, we made all these internet kind of videos. And I think, you know, as you get bigger and you start, hey, we're going to work with this little ad agency to do something. And it's like, 
oh, let's do this really produced thing that's got production value. And we're like, okay, cool. And we go and spend 60 grand to make something when we never spent more than five before. Mm -hmm. And you put this high production value thing on Instagram. And it's like that thing we spent all this money on perform one tenth of the thing we shot with an iPhone last week, you know? And it's just like, sometimes there's those moments where like, oh, right, let's get back. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. And let's remember why we're doing things and what works and the space that we're in and not just let what typical marketers gravi gravitate towards, like try to sway us in, into places. I think that's where, we, you know, maybe we've seen things where like, oh, maybe we should have done it differently. Yeah. Um Talk to me about the business. So it's water. There are flavors now, but it still is like pretty ingredient light, right? Compared to soda or tea or something like that. Like what do the margins end up being on water in a can? Well, I mean, the reason that a lot of water companies, like especially big billion dollar ones are not going to go to cans because plastic is dirt cheap. It's like a plastic bottle. These guys are probably getting those for like two cents. Mm -hmm. Like, Aluminum can might be 15 cents, you know, and that's the reason that aluminum actually gets recycled because the material has real value. They can melt it down, resell it at a profit as a recycling facility, and it's actually economically viable. Plastic is worth nothing. So if these guys were to spend the time trying to grind up plastic, they have to sell ground up plastic to people at a profit. They can't do that. Yeah. And they're not going to do that. So most of them, what they're doing is they get these plastic bottles in the recycling facility. They just send it to a landfill because they're like, we go out of business trying to recycle this. It's not actually viable. Um, but that means that it's going to be less margins for people who are trying to put things in cans versus plastic bottles. And when mm -hmm. you're a multi-billion dollar brand, nobody wants to take that kind of hit. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, the, the can's a big part of it. Um, but yeah, you know, we're still water in a can. Our flavors actually do have three grams of sugar from agave in it. Mm. Um, so it is kind of like, it's sort of this weird kind of fuzzy area, like between flavored sparkling water and healthy soda. But at the end of the day, all Coca-Cola is, is flavored sparkling water. It just has 50 milligrams of sugar. Yeah. I was going to say three doesn't sound, it's not that bad. Yeah. Three is not that big a deal. Um, and that was, that was how we wanted to go about it. Like, we know that a big reason for Liquid Death success is like, you know, mom is buying Liquid Death for her nine-year-old because he's excited to drink water or excited to drink something healthier. And, uh, you know, mom was never buying Fiji or Voss or other premium water for her nine-year-old prior to Liquid Death. Mm -hmm. So, we knew when we made a flavored product it had to be something that a nine-year-old would actually think is good. Like if you give a nine-year-old LaCroix, they don't necessarily think it's the best tasting thing. And in yeah. fact, most dudes actually don't really think LaCroix tastes that, that good. And you look at the, the data for like Gen Z, the number, like one of the most popular beverages is a Starbucks Frappuccino that's got like 60 grams of sugar. So it's <laughs> like, they want, they want sweetness. They want flavor. So you got to give them some if you're actually going to have them want to like be excited to, to consume it. So yeah, we, we kind of went into this zone where nobody had really done this before. It was either soda and diet soda. That's got tons of like, you know, artificial sweetener trying to mimic the taste of soda or there's zero cal, zero flavor LaCroix. There was like mm -hmm. really nothing in the middle. Um, and, you know, we, we very consciously thought that there was a cool opportunity there to do something where, yeah, there's way more flavor than a LaCroix and you could totally drink three or four a day and you're totally fine. You're not unhealthy. And then, yeah, we are actually, you know, some of the, you know, news came out like next year, we are going to be launching liquid death iced tea. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll be a healthier iced tea where it's like, you know, six grams of sugar for a 19 ounce can. Yeah. Um, 30 but you, but yeah. you still get that tall boy can, which is key. Yeah. 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 30, I grew up 30. in the, I grew up in the age of Arizona tea. It has, yeah, to no, be a, that, it has to yeah, be a that, giant can. I don't know why, but it does. Yeah, no, they, I mean, that, that's the thing. Like the tea category is like a $6 billion category. And there's like three brands that are all 30 years old and yeah. nobody, and there's not much interesting stuff going on in there. And it's, you know, it is, it's either like 20 plus grams of sugar, even for the quote unquote healthier stuff, or it's like unsweetened. There's not a lot in the middle, but in Japan, actually, like lightly sweetened iced tea is actually a much bigger thing where it's like 
four or five grams of sugar. Mm-hmm. And again, it's like this weird space where it's like low sugar hasn't has there hasn't been a brand yet that's really pushed it because it really is a brand thing. It's like right. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's interesting that we sort of are building this. It's more of like a healthy beverage platform. It's like we can go into all these different healthy beverage categories and be the cool, irreverent brand that brings new people into these healthy products that maybe weren't making healthy decisions before. Yeah. You know, uh, which I think is fun. I also, in addition to this show, I, I run our climate investments here. And um, I am super interested in the sustainability part of your brand and how hard or not hard you hit that messaging, you know, because it's there, but it's also like you don't necessarily want to end up in the the eco bucket. Well, it's it's also the sustainability story is the fact that cans are infinitely recyclable. Yep. But we can't own aluminum cans. It'd be like, why doesn't Red Bull market energy drink in a can? It's infinitely recyclable because every other competitor, they're, you're, you're using your marketing dollars to tell everybody why your competitors are great too. Right. So <laughs> by this can wor- and every other can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in a world where there is going to be multiple canned waters, like, yes, mm-hmm. we're the one who's, who, who are building the category. I think we're right now of canned still water. We're like over 70% of, of the market share right now. Um, but it's like, there's going to be several others. So why is someone going to pick a liquid death over canned Fiji or canned Dasani or canned whatever other water, it's the brand. Just like right. the reason people pick Budweiser over Miller or whatever else, or Red Bull over Monster. Um, so we always wanted to make sure we led with the brand first and built the brand. And then the secondary thing, which was, oh, and it's all about death the plastic, mm-hmm. aluminum's better. So people are buying the product for the brand, but they feel good about being a repeat purchaser because there's something more to it than just the brand. Right. So it's just another avenue to like feel good about this, basically right. a holistic yeah. brand experience. So right. then finally, um, how do you when you think about growing into this 700 million valuation, I think we determine that it's you're like the most popular or fastest growing D2C brand in history or some bananas thing like that. Is it does that all happen with beverages or does the platform expand? I saw, by the way, that you have a candle collab with Martha Stewart, yeah. which congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> like, that is awesome. We're probably going to just tack that video on to the end of this one because it's amazing. Uh, thank you. But like, how does how do you think about those brand extensions as a way to grow into just keep growing? Well, yeah, I mean, I think one of the parts of that, you know, you mentioned D 2 C brand. Well, I mean, we're not really a D 2 C brand anymore. In fact, yeah. like you can't even buy Liquid Death off our website anymore. Like we just oh. link you right to Amazon to, to buy it because and I think that's the problem with a lot. Most beverages have never been successful D to C because it's really expensive to ship a 14 pound case of water. Like if you try to just go to the FedEx and ship a case of liquid death, they charge you $20 and what's someone willing to pay for a case of water and everyone wants free shipping. So it's kind of like the economics of trying to ship heavy water yourself never really work out, but it helps build the brand before you have retail you know, exposure. And then now the fact that with like the Facebook or the Apple privacy stuff, you can't target people on social the way you used to or as cheaply or efficiently. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of D2C brands are struggling where they were really depending on those like customer acquisition costs being super efficient. Now they're not. Um, retail, it's like you're millions of people walking through stores or seeing your product. You know, you don't have to target them on Facebook to, to bring awareness. So, you know, I think that was something that's really helped us is, you know, knowing early on that water is something that ultimately needs to be a retail brand. Yeah. You know, it's not something that people just want to order on the internet. Um, and I think that that definitely helped us. And yeah, I think we're building a brand and brands can sell lots of things, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, we sell merch and apparel. You know, like, you know, we did like last year, we did almost $3 million just in t-shirts and hooded sweatshirts from our site. And we take that part of the business really seriously, just like a band like Metallica or Taylor Swift, like the amount of money they make on apparel 
it's like a huge part of their business. They work with cool artists. They take it very seriously. We're no different. Like it's a very serious part of our brand. We we don't want to just throw our logo on a shirt like swag. It's like no, we want to create a fashion brand, like something people want to wear, and that when we drop something, it sells out in two hours. Um, and then that has evolved into things beyond apparel, like candles with Martha Stewart, or you know, we did a crazy like metal vintage lunchbox that went crazy. We did a collab with Nixon watches. We did an all gold watch that had two ax hands as, as, as the hands on the watch sold out of that in like a week at like a $225 watch. So I think once you build a brand that stands for something way more than like the liquid that's in your product, you have a reason that people want to participate in the brand, to broadcast the brand to other people, to like covet it in terms of all different kinds of things. So yeah, I, I think we'll continue to do all kinds of things that, that, you know, as a brand, it's like, you can imagine there being like, we're not doing this, but it's like liquid death could literally have a hotel and people yeah. would probably go to it because it would be the most insane hotel experience, <laughs> you know, or funny thing that you could imagine. I feel like we're going to get off this call and you're going to start whiteboarding and like actually come to think of it. This hotel thing is awesome. <laughs> it was a thing that we actually, th- there was someone who had a connection to like, a group that would buy like old shitty motels and they were like, Oh, I wonder if there's a way to make like a liquid Amazing. death motel somewhere. And it's like, Oh, that is interesting. And we start to go full roofing. like Bates, like Bates. Yeah. On no, totally. it. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. I mean, I swear I'm going to let you go. I yeah. roughly have 10 to a thousand questions, but, um, but last one, like, in our industry specifically, right? Like, cause we invest mostly in tech startups. So we talk a lot about building and product and engineer and like design and brand is sort of part of it. We want there to be world-class design, but I think there's a lot of value for entrepreneurs in what you're saying about how the brand is the product. And there's something so kind of nothing could illustrate that better than the fact that the core product is water, right? right. Or underneath the core product and that the actual product is the brand and talk about how like i think people probably think that's easier than it is and you're proof that it's it's not it's a it's a lightning in a bottle kind of thing yeah i I usually use the analogy like when you get out of like if you ask someone hey could you come up with a great commercial most people would say yeah i think i could do that right because the bar is so low but if you say hey can you write a hit TV show and sell it to Netflix for $80 million? They're like, no, what are you talking about? I can't create a hit TV show. Um, So I think that's really what brand, like a hit brand is no different than a hit television show or a hit movie. It's like Mm -hmm. all these, there's a lot of nuance and detail and experience and things that go into that. And it's rare that they happen. Like how many shows does Netflix make before they get a hit? Like, how, how many movies does a studio have to release before they have a massive hit? Um, it's rare. It's hard. It's, it, you can't often predict it. Um, so it's very hard thing to do to build a truly hit brand that can do all these things. Yeah. Um, You're the so game yeah, of Thrones. Yeah. You're the game of Thrones of beverages. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, congrats again on all the success. I really appreciate the time. I could probably talk to you all day, but eventually we're just going to have to go to other meetings. Mike Cesario, co-founder and CEO, founder and CEO, co-founder. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what the, the thing is there. It's like if I started Boss. by myself, but then I brought on a co-founder, then I'm a co-founder. So I, I say either, but yeah. We're just going to go CEO. Okay. CEO of Liquid cool. Death, the Game of Thrones of Beverages. Love it. Well done, sir. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed today's show. I did. Great job on the Liquid Death uh, CEO interview. And tomorrow, tomorrow is Thursday. And we'll be having on Thursday what normally would have been our Wednesday Crypto Roundtable uh, with Vinny and Sunny. It's a great discussion about the Yuga Labs issue, Board Apes being investigated by the SEC. Mm. Lots to talk about. Really, really going to be a fun one. See you then. <laughs>